now like to introduce our speakers, but um, firstly, if I could, uh, I just want to set the scene with a few background slides. Thank you very much. And the next one. Um, this is really just an interesting graph. This shows the population of Western Australia since European settlement in 1829, and it's gone off the graph. And uh, you can see this, the steepness of the graph now. Obviously, that's partly a function of the scale, but it really does show you where we've come from and where we're going. Um, next slide, please. Um, what's behind it? Uh, well, if you saw that graph, you'd see when the population really kicked up. That was 2004, and it's probably not coincidental that in 2004, two commodities started to increase dramatically in price, and both iron ore and oil and gas. Uh, crude oil both kicked up in 2004 and kept rising. Uh, obviously, key drivers of our economy. And the next slide, please. Um, where are we going? A um, little bit of crystal ball gazing. Uh, per Perth is currently sitting at... I don't, I don't seem to have the mic distance quite right. Um, Perth is currently sitting at 1.85 million people and we're going to go to 2.6 in seven years' time, and believe it or not, 3 million people in 14 years' time. Now, that's the ABS median band forecast. It's not the high, and it's not the low, that's the median. So you're looking at a city of 3 million people in 14 years' time. And Western Australia will be going to 3.7 million in that 14-year period. And the next slide, please. Uh, what's the bigger picture from an economist's perspective? I, I can't have all these economists speaking today and not have a turn myself. Um, the USA is recovering rather slowly. Um, Europe, of course, is still staggering along. Um, Asia's fairly variable, and Japan's treating poorly. We need to keep this international framework in mind because the international demand is what drives our export industry. Thank you very much. So um, what I want to do today is just uh, spend uh, uh, 15 minutes going through the oil industry, looking at uh, where we are today, what's happened really. Uh, I think I was talking to some people outside and uh, really if you had a bunch of people, industry people in the, in the room uh, 12 months ago and said the oil price would be $45 a barrel, I don't think you would have thought there would be too many people who would have agreed with that. Um, maybe some people might have said, yeah, 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 it might go to 75 um, but just have a look at that. Um, the, the outlook, for my outlook, really, for the next uh, six months, two years, ten years, and we'll have a look at those volumes and prices. So really, it's all down to this graph. And this is the oil production out of the United States, and you see that it peaked in 2000 and, um, in 1972, and even with the uh, uh, oil coming out of Alaska in the uh, um, early 80s, <coughs> it still didn't reach that. Uh, peak, and by 2005, oil production had fallen to about 5 million barrels a day in the United States, and they consume about 20 million barrels a day. <coughs> so um, I was lucky enough to go to Eagleford Shale in about 2006, and then up to the Bakken in 2007, and really this whole shale oil thing was really kicking off big time then. The technology had been developed through the 1990s, and it was the rise in oil price in 2004, 2005, 2006 that saw the, a lot of money, a lot of effort being spent in the Eagleford Shale, the Bakken Shale, and then the uh, Permian Basin area. And then post the global financial crisis in late 2009, in early 2010, the number of rigs drilling on these horizontal plays just went ballistic. And as a result, we've seen um, effectively an extra four and a half million barrels of oil a day coming out of the United States uh, just in the last four years. And that's, I mean, for scale, that's like adding two Nigerias to the global oil supply in the space of four years. So it's been, an, it's been nothing short of, um, of pretty miraculous there. But um, what I'd like to do is, uh, what I've done is I've gone back and looked at a, a couple of uh, companies. I mean, uh, BHP Petroleum, for instance, oh, their onshore light tight oil business uh, last year generated four, uh, sorry, generated two, roughly $2 billion of operating cash flow and they spent 
four billion dollars of uh, on drilling and, and development, and the previous year it was even worse than that. So, effectively, these like this is in an environment I remember of one hundred and ten dollars a barrel. Um, BHP's uh, business uh, produces about um, three hundred thousand barrels of oil equivalent a day. So it's not a tin pot little business. Australia, for instance, produces about um, 340,000 barrels of oil a day um, and consumes about 840, 850,000 barrels a day. So for comparison, BHP's business producing 300,000 barrels of oil equivalent a day couldn't wash its face. It couldn't support itself without money coming from Wall Street. So um, this whole shale gale that we've seen, this whole uh, hiccup has really been uh, Sure, there was the technology, the horizontal drilling and the hydraulic fracture stimulation, all of that was there, but without the, the money coming from Wall Street, we wouldn't have seen it happen. Now, I've looked at another company called Brightburn, and again, that, it's a, a company producing about 51 million barrels of oil equivalent a day. So it's, it's for scale, it's twice as big as Beach, Beach Energy. And if you look at those, uh, their numbers, and, and I've looked at uh, you know, what they're saying, it's very clear what they're saying, their cash operating costs are about uh, $35, $36 US a barrel of oil equivalent. Um, and the prices they're getting uh, for, the, for the mix of product that they sell, which is oil, um, natural gas liquids and natural gas, about $60, $65 a barrel of oil equivalent. But their total all-up costs, which includes the cost of running the office in Denver, the interest that they pay on their debt, um, the um, uh, a modest dividend to shareholders. At the end of the day, you're in business to pay money back to shareholders. The 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 the, the cost that I calculate is about seventy dollars a barrel of oil equivalent, and on their current at the current gas price of about um, three dollars an MMBTU, that means they need about 75 US dollars a barrel and with $3 gas to basically run that business on, a, on, a, um, on an even keel. And that's, that's, not a, that's not a business that's going to be actually generating enough cash to, to produce enough uh, um, free cash to go back into the business. So effectively, if you want to have this type of light tight oil business, uh, that's going to uh, attract new capital to expand, you're going to need $90 a barrel plus, I think. So um, there's, I was attracted to a graph that was put up by the uh, chairman of um, Trans Transfer, Transfield, and they were going, oh, look, um, you know, we're operating in the US business, and they put up the graph showing how much oil is being produced in the United States and how great that is. and. Um, uh, they're in this business and it's all good and they put up this graph that shows uh, the global oil production. You can see the black line uh, going from left to right, it's rising and that's just oil. That's not natural gas liquids, it's not um, condensate, it's not um, uh, refinery gains, it's not biofuels, it's just black oil. And you can see that it's growing but the red bit is actually the light tight oil. And what that shows is that uh, since 2005, globally, the uh, production of oil has been on a plateau at around about 74 million barrels, 73, 74 million barrels of oil a day. And if it weren't for this light tight oil coming out of the United States, which is not, as I've just demonstrated, it's not $10 oil or not $20 oil even, um, the global oil production would have been falling. In fact, what that graph shows is that um, outside of the light tight oil, global uh, conventional oil, if you like, production peaked at the end of 2010. And during the last three years, over a period when the oil price was what? 100, $110 a barrel, uh, oil production has out, outside of the light tight oil has been falling. That's a picture that shows you peak conventional oil, which was in uh, the end of 2010. I mean, if you were producing oil if the price of oil was $110 a barrel and you could produce it and make money, you, you would have produced more, surely. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? But the graph shows you that there was no light tight oil coming out, no more. And uh, just to emphasize the point, there's this graph here that looks at the, um, the same, 
the same uh, sort of uh, measures, but what it actually does is it looks at the oil production on a um, dollar per barrel equivalence in today's dollars. So the, the, the dark green at the bottom, or the darker green at the bottom, the $25 a barrel oil, is sort of Saudi oil. It's that um, free oil that comes uh, from these uh, conventional uh, fields. Then you've got $42, $45, dollars a barrel oil. But if, the thing to do is to look at the $70 line, the black line at the top, and you can see again that that's actually been flatlining since about 2005. And over the last... Um, 10 years, 8 to 10 years, the, all of the expa expansion in global oil production has been oil that costs more than $70 a barrel to extract. And, you know, the top one is the, you know, Canadian tar sands. I think it's probably quite generous. Some of that is probably over $100 a barrel to actually produce. So um, what we're going to see is, um, is that um, I think over the next... Um, two or three months as the um, number of uh, drilling rigs uh, continues to fall away in the United States, there's a backlog of wells that have been drilled out there. Those wells will be completed and uh, put into production. So oil production in the United States will rise from what it is at the moment, about 9.4 million barrels a day, probably go up another couple of hundred thousand barrels of oil a day by May or June. But by July, I think oil production in the United States will be falling. And if the oil production stays sort of below 70, 60, 70 dollars a barrel by middle of 2016, oil production in the United States will have fallen by about 1.6 million barrels of oil a day. So that's the, the light tight. They'll stop producing. These things fall away, as you know, very quickly. And unless they're drilling uh, a lot of wells, you know, just to stand still, you have to drill a lot of wells. Uh, so there's a bit of inertia there. And uh, so what, what's actually happened in the market is that the Saudis saw this happening five, ten years ago, and they thought, well, if we push the oil price down, um, eventually the oil price will go back up and these guys will just bob back up at us. So they, they played what I like to call, um, you know, the rope of dope They remember Muhammad Ali and got the guy to beat the living Davites out of him until he was completely exhausted, and then Ali came out with the king hit and punch. So the Saudis have boxed pretty clever here. And they've seen these guys that the, the whole light tight oil business is completely unsustainable from a cash flow point of view. And the only people making money out of this have been Wall Street bankers who've been, you know, pumping the money in and uh, taking fees along the way. It's, it's really the, the, the whole um, prime, subprime lending thing all again. I'm sub, you know, and we know how that ended in 2005, 2006. They had these ninja loans, no income, no jobs, you know. And the same sort of thing is happening in the oil industry. The Wall Street's been pumping money into these people. Um, Saudis have seen this happening. They're waiting until they get completely up to here. L uh, Brightburn, for instance, has negative working capital and it's got about 51% gearing. So the, the Saudis have been tightening a noose around these smaller companies, watching as they blow their balance sheet out of the water with a lot of debt and then uh, push the price down and so that these guys won't come back because in April they're going to have to all refinance their debt and that's the time that these companies are actually going to go belly up. So I put this, um, I put this up because it's a recent, uh, it's February's BP's view and I don't want to sort of cut these guys' lunches who are coming after me, uh, but it shows here uh, the arrival of, the big impact of the arrival, arrival of China over the last 15 years where you've had this um, uh, massive... Um, uh, increase in uh, uh, coal and, and also um, the expectations of much uh, higher involvement of renewables as we go forward over the next um, 10 or 20 years. And uh, finally, Murray asked me to have a, a few words about what's happening on the local scene. Um, on the local scene, it's not really about oil, it's about gas. So this is a, a, a database which I've tried to quickly update, uh, looking at, um, uh, you know, the, we've got the, the LNG project uh, that Woodside runs and then there's Pluto. Uh, there was meant to be a Pluto too, but that didn't happen. And now Woodside's been able to come in sideways into, um, into Wheatstone through Apache. Uh, you've got a lot of... Uh, um, a gas being developed at Browse, um, a Prelude Shells Project, Ichthyus, which is going to Darwin, um, and uh, 
the um, a Gorgon, of course, which is uh, which is all crunching along. So there's a, a there's a heck of a lot of money being spent on these projects, and um, these people will be looking very nervously at the price of gas because uh, when the gas price is fifty dollars a barrel, or sorry, when the oil price is fifty dollars a barrel, the LNG price is like seven dollars eighty a gigajoule. So um, they won't be too happy about that. Um, so the policy outcomes on this is really, uh, from my point of view, if I'm saying we're at peak oil uh, currently, uh, and you know this, there's still a lot of oil, there's probably 50% of, of the oil that was ever put in the ground still there to be uh, extracted, but it won't, uh, in 10 years' time, we'll be producing it at a lot less uh, rate than we currently are. So we need these renewable energy technologies to come on uh, rapidly. Uh, a five to ten year time horizon. I doubt that we can do it that quickly, but you know it's certainly the most rapidly growing sector at the moment. Um, I think that from an Australian point of view, we need to look very closely at a resource uh, depletion de depletion management protocol. Um, you know, if we have a certain amount of gold or nickel or iron ore or gas in the ground, um, we shouldn't just consume it in 20 years, um, what are our grandchildren going to say to us? What, you burned it all? What, you know, you didn't leave anything for us? Um, and I think we need to be very careful to make sure that we retain local refining uh, capacity in Australia from a security point of view. And I think we should also look at uh, stockpiles, a strategic stockpile, and it has been reported recently that, you know, if the oil, if the product stopped flowing from Singapore, to us, uh, you know, petrol stations in Sydney would run out with, within a matter of days, certainly less than a week. We don't have stockpiles. And I think we need to just be planning for resilience, given the energy challenges we have, uh, and a strategic focus on food, transportation, defence and, uh, and pricing. Thank you. Peter, that's just exactly what we wanted. Um, the format for today is that we're going to get each speaker to give their presentation. Um, they've been allotted close to 15 minutes each, and then we're going to sit them on those lovely white stools. They're all four of them lined up, and you're going to throw things at them, as in the, as in the nature of questions, not to, not not the desserts you've got there. Um, our second speaker, Bill Moody, is already up there on the board. Bill's a qualified economist with postgraduate qualifications in business and leadership. He has over 25 years' experience in commercial and senior management roles in the mining and energy industry. Bill spent 18 years with BHP Billiton, chiefly in iron ore and metallurgical coal marketing, including near 10 years based in Tokyo and London. Bill joined West Farmers, where he held various senior marketing and business development roles in the energy division. Uh, like a lot of us, Bill's now working as a consultant in the resources sector. His experience brings unique insights and understandings of the coal industry and electricity generation in Western Australia. Please welcome Bill to the podium. Hello. In the um, 15 minutes available to me, I hope to provide you with an understanding of the status of the WA coal industry and, and its outlook. So first, uh, maybe just a quick review of, to put the industry in context. Coal has become a key, or has been a key contributor to WA's economic development. It's the backbone, or has been the backbone of the energy industry for many years, uh, since first coal was mined in 1898, almost 120 years ago, and with it, over 200 million tonnes of coal extracted since then. WA has coal resources of 6.4 billion tonnes, sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot in the Australian context. Um, around 900 million tonnes of that is, is classified as economic demonstrated resources and is located at Collie. That's classified by the Department of Mines and Petroleum. The coal quality is, is uh, from, for Collie coal, it's sub-bituminous coal, which is, a, is a, a black coal that carries a high level of moisture, so it's about 25% moisture. Um, it has low ash, low sulphur and low trace elements. It is ideal for use at nearby power stations and for industrial use. It's got some very good characteristics for industrial uh, consumption. Um, two companies, 
currently mine coal in about 1960. Premier Coal and Griffin Coal became the two main companies mining coal in Western Australia. And that has uh, obviously uh, continued. Premier Coal is now owned by Yang Zhao Coal Mining Company, um, which was purchased by them in late 2011. And Griffin Coal was purchased by Lanco Infratech, an Indian company, in late 2010. Looking at the customers, uh, we have uh, electricity, well first of all production is around 7 million tonnes a year, it's been quite stable. Um, about 75% of that goes to the electricity industry, so Synergy and Blue Waters. Coal-fired generation accounts for 50 to 55% of electricity generated on the, on the Swiss. It's also a very important source of uh, energy for industrial customers in the state, notably the alumina industry, uh, mineral sands and cement and lime manufacture. Right, this chart gives you a bit of background. Uh, since 1950, coal production, uh, obviously it's stepped up quite significantly uh, along with the population growth in Western Australia. Um, the uh, coal production grow, grew, the fastest rate of growth was in the 1970s, so in that decade from 1970 to 1980, it grew by 160%, and the 2000s was the slowest rate of growth at around 13% per annum. Uh, sorry, 13% total, not per annum. Um, real coal prices, the line, have dropped markedly, particularly well, obviously in the last 25 years. Uh, so that's 2013 dollars showing uh, a major decline from $4 a gigajoule to around about $2 a gigajoule over that period of time, average coal prices. And production stabilised, as I mentioned, at around 7 million tonnes. The current position of the coal industry, uh, turning to that, uh, mining conditions have become more difficult in recent years. Uh, as new mining areas are developed, at, and old areas are depleted and new mining areas developed, uh, invariably these, these areas are less desirable from a mining viewpoint and than the previous areas. It can be represented in metrics such as the strip ratio, which is the amount of waste, in usually represented in bank cubic metres, to the ton, tonnes of coal produced. So strip ratios have increased from about five tonnes of waste, four or five tonnes of waste per bank cubic metre, now to seven and moving towards eight tonnes of waste per bank cubic metre of coal. Now to put that into sort of layman's terms, a bank cubic metre of waste weighs about 1.6 tonnes, so 7 BCM to 1 tonne of coal means you're moving about 11 to 12 tonnes of waste to liberate 1 tonne of uh, reasonably low priced coal. The uh, the seams themselves have become more numerous and uh, compared to the fewer thicker seams that used to be mined, the old Muja pit with its 10 metre seam, Muja pit on the Griffin side, pit four on the Premier Coal side uh, was, was the go-to seam for the miners. They blended it with other, other pits but finally that's finished so the, uh, the miners now have to deal with thinner and more numerous coal seams in the new areas they're mining. Uh, the new pits are more complex geologically including faulting and steeply dipping seams. Uh, deeper pits involve more significant, or involve dewatering, removing water, because obviously Col Col Collie is quite a, a, a damp place and there's a lot of underground water. Uh, so removing that water and treating it prior to uh, liberating it to the environment. Uh, greater distances from co coal processing facilities and more complex mine planning and quality control to ensure that sulphur and ash uh, particularly meet customer requirements. All these factors lead to high costs for the miners, particularly the strip ratio. Uh, the, the industry has also <coughs> suffered from uh, significant cost escalation. During the mining boom, of course, capital equipment, tyres, uh, parts for a, part, well, you know, capital equipment itself, the tyres for the equipment, the parts for the equipment, um, labour fuel, all those things rose dramatically. Uh, and that was fine if you were selling iron ore and your price rose dramatically. But the poor old Collie coal miners uh, had long-term domestic contracts with relatively flat prices linked to CPI, meaning that 
they, their prices, uh, their costs shot up, but their prices were rather stable, causing a, you know, a major squeeze for them. Coal exports uh, have been looked at particularly by Griffin Coal, and uh, you know they've aggressively tried to very hard to develop that business, and have exported a significant amount of coal over the last uh, five, six, seven years. Um, at, at present, uh, with coal prices at, at lows, uh, it's, it appears to be not overly economic. Uh, Indonesian coal prices have dropped now to 45 to 50 dollars US dollars a ton, FOB Indonesia, and they're close to all the customers, the Indonesian mines. They're close to all the Asian customers, India, uh, Japan, China, Korea, making it very difficult for a, a small Western Australian producer to compete on a delivered basis. So in that sense, uh, coal coal is a captive energy source best suited uh, or to serving domestic markets. Clearly, coal is really important to the state's energy mix, 50 to 50 per cent of the fuel use for generation on the, on the Swiss. Um, and it's a low cost source of electricity, as we saw on the chart earlier, you know, two to three dollars a gigajoule. Um, it provides a, a secure source. It's, uh, it's physical, it exists, you can stockpile it. Um, there's two miners, there's various for forms of transport, conveyors, trains uh, and trucks to get the coals to the customers. And it's, a, it, and it's located close to the, the hub of the state's energy infrastructure, power stations. So it certainly plays an important part in a, in a balanced energy portfolio. WA is actually quite, in the Australian context, its reliance on coal is reasonably low at 50%. Um, on the East Coast, that's normally around 80%. New South Wales, Queensland in particular. So uh, the combination of more difficult mining conditions, external cost increases and low prices with flat escalation has meant that the coal companies are under significant financial strain. The, the companies have instituted uh, over many years cost reduction programs, work very hard on reducing costs, consultants have been involved in and out, all the, all the big name consultants currently in McKinsey are doing work at Griffin I believe. Um, and that's resulted in lots of rationalisations with staff and, uh, and projects aimed at finding operational efficiencies. But to some extent these savings have been offset by higher mining costs, as we discussed earlier. So the companies uh, have been regularly losing money um, in recent times, and that clearly can't be sustained, which brings us to the outlook. Coal demand appears to be stable for about the next 10 years, no major changes, around 7 million tonnes a year. Uh, however, there's, there are potential as is potential demand growth out there. With the competitiveness of coal, uh, it is a very good chance that a new coal-fired power station would be built to replace retiring units in the, perhaps in the mid-2020s. Uh, new projects that the coal companies have been uh, involved in include gasification, um, pertinent chemicals and fertilisers have gone quiet for the time being, but that still sits in the background, along with other potential uh, projects to use uh, uh, gasified coal. Uh, West Farmers, or sorry, uh, Premier Coal has a, uh, has a char project that was actually developed in the West Farmers days. Uh, underground coal gasification is under continuing examination by a number of smaller companies. And carbon capture and storage is being developed uh, with assistance from the state government and a number of firms in, in the state, particularly the the uh, Southwest Hub project. Coal also provides a good option for low cost energy for the future. For instance, if there was a um, uh, aluminium was to become smelt, uh, an aluminium smelter was to be built, uh, would require very low cost energy to be competitive and, and coal would be maybe well placed for that. And of course exports still sit out there as a possibility, particularly when the export prices improve. However, first of all, the businesses need to survive. The companies are working to improve their businesses and 
they appear, both Lanco and Yankol, appear to be in there for the long run. Um, there's only two ways they can improve their businesses, and that's uh, either to increase revenues or decrease costs. Uh, Griffin and Premier have already received some price relief on their large electricity contracts, and customers will be reluctant, I think, to, uh, to revisit that, that well um, until they see significant cost reductions at the mine, so the mines themselves playing their part. Um, so that means addressing the cost sides of things. Um, increasing productivity and addressing operational costs is absolutely essential. New technology has been investigated at Collie constantly, um, such things as in-pit in pit crushing, um, uh, bucket wheel reclaimers in the pit, um, uh, drag lines, surface miners, all sorts of new technologies, new things, and, and th those haven't worked for one reason or another. The optimum mining setup has proven to be two 40 tonne trucks with shovels of about 35, you know, large shovels of about 35 cubic metre capacity, giving a sufficient flexibility for the smaller pits in, in the Collie area. Um, new techniques that might come out uh, include automa automation, um, e.g. the driverless trucks that are being developed in the Pilbara uh, may make their way down, uh, down uh, to the southwest. But what's most important, I think, is to see constructive engagement with the workforce. They are part of the solution uh, and need to work together with the companies to find, to find a, uh, a way through this, this squeeze. So it's clear that uh, coal will remain an important part of the state's energy system for the foreseeable future. Uh, there's some hard yards there for the miners, but they will continue plugging at it and uh, hopefully we see a, a good balanced outcome. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. A wonderful summary. Stable temperatures with storm clouds gathering. Um, you may have noticed, um, those of you who are particularly astute, that this event is being filmed and the video will go up on the AIE website, uh, probably under the members only area. So uh, if you're not a member, you either need to join or talk to one of your friends. Um, there may be an opportunity at the end if you're nice to the cameraman to do a little song and dance routine. And I noticed Ashurst have got a nice corporate table here. They could probably do a team song, um, but I digress. Um, Richard Harris has more than 20 years experience in the energy industry in WA, working in both the public and private sectors. Richard is currently chairman of the WA Independent Power Association, representing private generators and retailers in the electricity market. Richard's also director of the WA-based renewable energy development company WestGen and director of government relations for strategic communications firm Cannings Purple. Richard's previous roles include project director for the development of ERM uh, near about power station and WA director for new gen power and ERM power. Prior to taking up his private sector roles, Richard had a long career in government as advisor to both sides of politics on resources and energy policy. Please welcome Richard. <laughs> Thank you, Murray. Uh, given my uh, background, as Murray said, I've got a, a bit of a policy uh, background, so uh, my, my talk today is going to be a mixture of looking at energy policy in relation to the electricity market and uh, an overview of what's happening currently in the market. Um, my comments will focus on the Swiss. Uh, because that's the, the only uh, market we've got at the moment, although I understand people are looking to do things in the Pilbara. Good luck to them. I tried uh, when I was in government, and uh, I think a few others have tried and failed there. Um, I just uh, opening comment is that um, Murray, I think, invited me a couple of years ago when we formed the IPA in 2012 to talk about what we were doing and what was happening in the market. And at the time, I said... Whatever we don't, whatever we do, we shouldn't merge synergy and vert. <laughs> well, we got that one wrong. Um, 
so I'll look at uh, a look at where we are, where we've come from, and a little bit of where where we might be going to, particularly in some of those policy settings, because currently before the government is the electricity market review, and hopefully we'll get some outcomes of that this year, and I'll have a look at what some of the things that might be included in that. As quickly as I, I said, the, uh, the ARPA was formed in 2012 with um, private sector generators and retailers, but it had a history going back informally way before then uh, to the early days of electricity market reform where private, uh, private companies got together to lobby to open up the electricity market in WA. So a lot of people put a lot of effort into getting the market that we currently have. It didn't just come out of nowhere. It was a lot of people put a, a, a lot of um, effort in shaping the market. Those reforms came in in 2006, uh, and its market is slowly evolving uh, since then. And IPA has formalised that, that group that was put together, and our, our main objective is to, is to lobby and advocate on behalf of the private sector to see more competition in the market uh, and um, foster private sector investment in, into the market. What happened? Uh, I think we all know. Uh, uh, Western Power was disaggregated. We set up a wholesale electricity market in the Swiss, set up the independent market operator to run it. Limitations were put on Synergy and Verve that they weren't allowed to get in each other's markets in terms of generation and retail. But the ob overall objective was greater competition and the idea that competition would get a better outcomes for c customers and would allow private sector investment in the electric electricity market, taking the load off the government as the main, up until that point, as the main investor in electricity supply. 2013, Synergy and Verve were remerged. Um, however, the electricity market review was established and um, we have the opportunity to continue down the market reform process. Just in case you, if, you know, the, the, uh, it's, I'm painting a picture where it's, uh, it's not been all rosy. Uh, some good things have come out of the, the electricity market today. Um, incredibly good things. We've had two and a half thousand megawatts of generation established, new generation, and the majority of that is private sector generation. $3 billion worth of private sector investment is a considerable amount of money that otherwise the state would have had to, had to spend. Currently, independent power producers and DSM account for around 50% of generation capacity in the Swiss, up from 11% in 2005 6 So that's a, a remarkable achievement. And we have a whole bunch of new participants in the market, generators, retailers, customers, and aggregators, people who who operate in the market getting the best deals for customers. We have a limited contestable market in, in that it doesn't apply to the residential customers, but in that contestable, contestable market, I have to say, it is very vibrant and there is churn. In other words, customers can choose their electricity supply and they are doing that and getting good deals. We have a bunch of different types of investment uh, in generation, coal, gas, liquids, wind and solar. So in other words, the market has delivered a range of benefits in terms of new generation, customer choice. New projects, uh, and I've got a couple of those, looking at biomass, wave, and waste to energy, again, lining up if there is opportunities in the market. And IMO itself has run a market evolution program, so it hasn't stopped still. The market has evolved to, to become more responsive and increase its efficiency. And particularly the introduction of the balancing market, I have to say, is, has been a great achievement for, for IMO. That's the background of the market, of where we come from. I just want to have a look at now what's happening in the market. Uh, and I guess the idea uh, that, that if we'd have forecast this six years ago, we, we would have, uh, nobody would have got it right. Um, and nobody's got it right around the world, by the way. That, the mar uh, currently, electricity markets are, are changing rapidly based around largely solar, rooftop solar coming in. And that, that has had a dramatic impact on the Swiss and the, and the behaviour of customers. Coupled with that, uh, and you see on the left-hand side, is the falling demand um, from the residential sector. So total sales have fallen, even though 
total customers have increased. So in other words, there are more and more electricity customers as houses get built. And normally that would provide you a long to a steady growth in the market of consumption of around about 3% per annum. Um, instead, the customers are growing, but the demand is falling. Together with both in installation of PVs on roof, rooftops, you have increased energy efficiency and you, your uh, increased energy efficiency stands in buildings and appliances, coupled also with rising electricity prices. That has driven customer behavior to reduce demand. Uh, should acknowledge, by the way, these slides are courtesy of uh, independent market operator. Um, if you ever want to learn more about the electricity market, go to their website. Fantastic website. Um, this just to give you some idea of the uh, installation of PV on, on uh, rooftops. Currently, there is more than 429 megawatts of installed capacity on rooftops. 170,000 systems alone in the Swiss. And the installations are cu currently running, as of last year, around about two megawatts per week. 429 megawatts is, by, is, is larger than by far any single power generation unit in the Swiss. The next, next biggest is around about 330 megawatts as a single generating unit. So that installed capacity is in of, of new generation, which is what PVs are on rooftops, they're, 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 they're household <coughs> generators. That is increasing at a considerable rate and is not slowing down. And the business case for commercial customers is becoming more compelling as those costs are reducing. A lot of the uh, installation of uh, the original installation of PV on rooftops, uh, both from feed-in tariffs and driven by the RET, largely is now driven by saving, saving electricity co costs for householders and businesses. That's at the small scale. At the larger scale, we have players in the market are also responding to, to the market signals. We have a capacity and energy market and the capacity market, the price of capacity has to be met by large customers and retailers. And they, they large customers are making their own decisions about how to reduce demand or reduce their requirement to pay for capacity. Those responses uh, in the summer of uh, 2014 uh, estimated that reduced demand by an average of about 50 megawatts because of action ta taken by larger customers in the Swiss. What this all means, and th these are again IMO's forecasts, and you see starting on the, at the top was in your forecast in 2010, the bottom one is the current forecast which is also takes into account the high customer rep response scenario from 2014. In other words, you look at that line and demand is flatlining. Slight increase, but ba basically it's come right down to, to negligible growth over the next few years up until the 2020s. Just a quick look at what's happening on the generation side as a result of the market. And as you can see on the moving from 2006, 5, 6 to 2015, 16, we have a steady increase in the growth of private sector investment and generation. Synergy's share is currently sitting around 50%, almost exactly at 50%. But on the private sector side, you have a mixture of um, private sector investors, uh, some of the main ones, uh, uh, Alinta, Western Energy, um, Goldfields Power, ERM, uh, Meriden Energy, and some of the big wind farms, Colgar Wind Farm and Blue Waters Power. Diversification of fuel mix. And interestingly, what this shows is, and Bill will be happy, the coal is increasing, um, but gas is decreasing. Renewable share has increased from 2005, six. Depending on what happens to the rent, that might, that might increase uh, going forward. Uh, but the, the gas has shrunk, um, again, probably reflecting the increasing price of gas um, and, and the stabilisation in the price of coal. Entry, there's been an interesting exit and entry into in new capacity into the market since 2006-07. Uh, um, 
largely the exit has been dual, uh, dual fuel. Um, coal, uh, standalone coal has stayed there. Um, and uh, gas and uh, renewables have also entered into the market. But over the last couple of years, as you see, not much new has entered into the market. Uh, and again, in, unless the, there isn't renewable energy um, coming in, uh, it's hard to see any new gas or coal plant getting built in the next few years. Okay, I just, that was a nice snapshot of uh, the industry and where we're at. Um, let's have a look at the policy settings. Um, we started off in 2005-06 with a bang of electricity reform. Um, then it, it slowed and uh, not, not a lot of major structural reform has occurred since then. This doesn't mean we should stop still uh, and, and we shouldn't continue the market reform and the government, as I said, initiated electricity market reform last year. Recommendations are currently with the government. Market reform needs to take into account, as, as we've looked, changing technology and consumption patterns, especially renewables and battery storage. In other words, markets need to be flexible, policy settings need to be flexible because we're never, quite, we're never going to be 100% sure what are the, 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 the customer behaviours as we go forward. They need to be responsive, in other words. Reforms going forward also need to take into account the investments that have already been made. We're not starting from afresh. This is a market that's evolved. It's not a, not a brand new, we can't have a brand new market to replace this. That is, was largely the consensus of the submissions to the electricity market review. In other words, that it needs to, any further, further reform needs to take into account the investments that have already been made and build on that reform but overwhelmingly, the, the, the people who have put in submissions said there needs to be structural, more structural reform of the GTEs. In other words, Synergy is still the dominant player in the market, particularly after the merging of Synergy and Verb. There was no great appetite for moving to the NEM or an energy-only market. And I think most submissions said we should move to, towards FRC for retail contestability. Finally, well, what are we going to get this year? Well, wait and see. Um, understand the recommendations are with government and government will likely be making its response very shortly to what, what it, 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 its response to those um, submissions and the, the report of the committee doing the electricity market reform. I, I suspect the reforms will be largely in line with the submissions made to the, to the, to the review, which don't, that will be more an evolutionary rather than revolutionary approach. I doubt that Synergy will get split. In fact, it probably uh, lay, lay odds of uh, pretty good money that it won't be. Um, I think there was a compelling case, case to split, split it, but politically I think that's too hard for the government. It is likely, I think, that system management might come out of Western Power and merge with IMO. Again, that would be a good reform. We'll have a capacity mechanism going forward, I suspect, but the price curve will steepen. Demand side management will be harmonised with supply side so, so that they're both playing by the same rules. And I think in terms of networks, network access, <coughs> we're likely to move to a constrained network access model, very much like the NEM, um, with co-optimisation of energy and ancillary services. In other words, <coughs> dispatch linked with, um, with access which is something I think industry has been pushing for for a long time. In terms of regulation, yes, it seems though the network will probably move over to be regulated by the uh, Australian Energy Regulator. Look, those are reforms which are useful, but we still have uh, the un untackled reform of government ownership of the main, the main player. Unfortunately, I think that needs to wait to another day. Thank you. Well spoken, Richard. There are, we, we do need to leave some issues for another day. Um, you have laid the groundwork very nicely for our next speaker, who's going to talk about renewables. Louis Kent is manager at Energetics. He's an energy scientist and an economist, having completed energy studies at Murdoch University in its heyday as a sustainable energy school. 
He's worked at GHD and now Energetics, where his work focuses on building services, sustainable design, renewable energy sources, and carbon reduction strategies. Um, I'd just like to note that Louis was a key member in establishing the young energy professionals in Perth, and we are delighted that he's taken on the role of vice chairman uh, to me of the uh, us oldies in the Australian Institute of Energy. He brings some energy to that role, which I'm afraid is starting to fade from my ageing and rather grumpy body. Um, so please welcome the new energy, Louis Kent. Thanks, Murray. Um, just before I get into the slides, um, if you go back a few years and you had a panel like this and um, one person was talking about renewables, they didn't need to worry about any of their points being stolen because everyone thought they were crazy. But um, a few of my points have been stolen, not many, so it's not a problem. Um, let's see if this works. Maybe. There we go. We'll start setting the scene. Just um, I'll, I'll be talking about the investment history, past sort of decade, various forecasts, because there's always a few people with different opinions. I'll cover off on some of the policy issues affecting the renewables industry, and then just at the end, some of the interesting headlines from the year, just um, to bring you up to speed with the exciting stuff. Now, across um, the board, it seems like it's pretty good news for renewables everywhere, apart from grid-scale renewables in Australia. Um, which have taken a bit of a dive, because primarily because of policy uncertainty, but I'll, I'll get into that down the track a bit. I'll start with a bit of history. Okay, it's caught up. So, the past 10 years, um, it's been generally fairly rapid growth. Uh, 2011 was the record year, and not only was that the, um, the record for investment in new renewable capacity that year, but it was also the first year that global investment in renewable capacity exceeded global investment in conventional generation capacity. Uh, so that was a bit of a milestone. After that, you can see it took a dive for a couple of years, which initially looks bad until you look into some of the reasons for it. One of the reasons is policy uncertainty. Um, but a, a large component of the fall was actually driven by the rapid decrease in the cost of PV cells. So there's a slide a bit later on that you'll see, uh, even though PV installations continued to rapidly increase, the total expenditure decreased so rapidly because of the falling prices that it resulted in a, a reduction in total investment. Uh, and good to see that 2014 it's recovered, got to the second best year, almost up at the record year there. Right. Um, looking forward though, what's going to happen? On the left, that's Bloomberg New Energy Finance and um, that's one of the more optimistic scenarios. It has us getting to 49% of installed capacity. So you can see that the, the grey line at the bottom, in case those words are too small, the, the, the grey section at the bottom of the left graph is the uh, conventional fuels. Uh, red is nuclear, yellow solar, blue wind, and green is other renewables. Um, so you can see pretty much straight away, it's, it, it already exceeded 50% of new capacity in 2011. That only builds, and by the time you get to 2030, it's actually 49% of total installed capacity is renewables under that prediction. Switch to the right-hand side, that's from the um, BP Energy Outlook. Um, they go out to 2035, so another five years further on, and that little bit of orange up the top is renewables, so it's uh, not quite so optimistic there. I was wondering what kind of um, assumptions led it to being so small, and um, if you have a look at the, the index, I was flicking through trying to find the renewable section, it's actually in a, a chapter there, coal and non-fossil fuels, which I thought was a little interesting to put those two together. So that might give you a bit of a flavour of, um, of how they were assessing these things. So Bloomberg on the left, um, that was BP on the right. This is the International Ed Energy Agency. It's a bit, bit of a busy um, diagram here, but Sankey's a good fund, so I thought I'd better throw it in. The bottom left is where we are at the moment, so that's existing plant. The right-hand side is where they predict will be by 2035. The top left is the new generation capacity that will need to come in to get us there. And um, the bit down the bottom is retirement of plants. Uh, with this one, the, um, the first chunk of those, those three columns there is the installed capacity. So they're predicting 40% by 2035. Bloomberg was 
49 by 2030, so that's um, it's not far off, but it's not as optimistic. And investment in the period 2014 to 35, 61% they forecast to be uh, renewable investment. Uh, a little comment on the, the bit dropping down the bottom there, the retirement of plant. There are renewables that are installed now that they've got retiring be before 2035 and also a little bit of stuff yet to be installed that retires be before 2035. And that's because they've used the, the <coughs> nameplate um, uh, asset life of the solar panels or wind turbines and said after 20 years or 25 years, they'll be retired and you'll need to in invest in new stuff. What we've seen in the field is that generally wind turbines and solar panels last a lot longer than that 20 to 25 years. So hopefully there's a slightly better story there. Okay, one more. Um, this is the one that I referred to earlier as far as PV dropping in price. You can see 2013 there was the, the year where it was most dramatic um, and the investment in PV went down 22%, but 32% increase in actual installations. So that's a pretty dramatic swing there. Um, in addition to solar's price dropping, uh, once again, Bloomberg New Energy Finance have come out with some analysis earlier last year saying that uh, unsubsidised new build wind farms in Australia can supply electricity 14% cheaper than new coal and 18% cheaper than new gas capacity. And that's in the scenario, they did a couple of scenarios, that's the scenario assuming no carbon price over the asset life. So if you get a carbon price any time in, that, in the, the next sort of 20, 25 years of asset life that they've assumed, then that helps build the case. So um, I'll, I'll be very surprised if we see another coal-fired power station built in WA. Um, if someone wants to put a bet on it, I'll go a cart and a beer. Got to wait a bit to get it, but I reckon it's a good bet. Um, in addition to that, investment in renewables, as, as the price of wind and solar decreases, the, the investment decisions are less driven by policy and more just driven by underlying economics. And that, that means that the, um, the political issues that we're seeing at the moment as far as the rep review having a dramatic effect on our industry, the, the, uh, the intensity of the political implications in future years will be decreased as they become more cost competitive just through lower prices. And there is a, um, a point on the bottom there, but you can't quite see it. It's um, just talking about that's, that's the snapshot of Australia, the, the impacts of lower prices there. But over the, um, the period to 2035, the majority of new generation capacity built globally is in non-OECD countries. And a lot of them are developing countries where it's about electrification of rural areas. Those areas don't have electricity grids at the moment. Electricity networks are very expensive. So they'll be looking at, on one hand, do I go for cheaper renewables? Or on the other hand, do I go for marginally more expensive conventional fuels plus the cost of a network? If, if you're talking about residential applications, of course, industrial and commercial ap applications, there's always a place for a grid, but there's also a growing place for off-grid. And in those countries, I think that's um, prime territory for it. We'll just jump to the next slide, please. So I've given you the overview of large uh, renewables globally, locally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a pretty dramatic decline, 88% in fact, um, in 2014 compared to 2013. Uh, in 2013, we're sitting at 11th in the world for investment in new renewable capacity. Over the period of a year, we've dropped down to 39th behind Honduras, Costa Rica, and the clean energy powerhouse of Myanmar. Good. I'm not very good at sarcasm, but I think that one worked, so that's good. Um, we'll jump to the next one, thanks. There's good news, though. The good news is what was mentioned before, PV installations are continuing to grow. Uh, the, the best year looking at that, I think, was 2011. 2013 was a slightly um, uh, less successful year. I think it was down 35%, but this year has been uh, an increase yet again. I had to... The, the reason that's red is because I had to... Photoshop that graph to get the new data in because I couldn't find a graph with the current data on. And the current data is interesting because at the end of 2014, we ticked over to over four gigawatts of rooftop PV installed in Australia, which is over 1.3 million systems. We'll jump to the next one, please. Medium term forecast. We saw the longer term ones there and I didn't want to weigh in with that because it's a bit too difficult, but I'll have a, I'll have a guess at the medium term locally, volumes, I think it's 
um, fair enough to assume there's a good chance that volumes will increase compared to 2014 simply because they were so low. Um, we're, we're coming from a very low base there. And I'd also um, suggest that there's a lot of large-scale renewable energy projects that we'll put on hold waiting for the outcome of the RET review. Once that is resolved, then there's probably a bit of a backlog of um, projects and a bit of catching up to those. So we might see um, a healthy year once that RET review is resolved. That's Renewable Energy Target for anyone that's not familiar with the acronyms. Um, large scale is still very influenced by policy uncertainty, which is what we saw with this year being so low. Prices. Now, I think PV and wind, the, the cost of the technology globally is continuing, continuing to reduce, and I don't see that um, switching around. It's not going to increase. It's not like uh, oil, where you can see the, um, the growth has been in the, um, the above $70 a barrel oil. You got um, tide oil, oil sands, shale oil, all of these things are higher cost. Deep water oil is, um, is higher cost. With coal getting worse stripping ratios and getting all soggy, which no one likes, so it's, um, it's increasing in cost once again. With wind and PV, it's a um, question of technical progress and the prices keep on coming down. The reason I've got that up there is because the other thing that's been going down is our exchange rate, and that makes renewables, imports of renewables, more expensive for us. So um, hopefully the balance of that will be that they don't go up too much, but yet to see. Forecast on ownership. Um, because renewables are changing quite dramatically, there's new opportunities opening up, and there's a bit of a lag between the opportunity actually presenting itself and people acting upon it. Because renewable capacity is so much smaller in the incremental unit size, it opens up owning generation to a whole range of, um, of people and companies that wouldn't in the past have owned generation capacity. So community groups, there's um, community, community wind projects internationally, there's community wind projects on the east coast, and I'm involved in trying to get one up here, but it's a bit of a challenge. Um, so communities are starting to look at generation as something that they want to invest in and then the concept of the prosumer where being on the grid and consuming electricity is not only a one-way street anymore. You can start generating your own and installing your own capacity. We'll jump to the next one. Policy issues. I've already covered off on the RET so I won't go on about that in too much detail other than to say the um, Origin CEO Grant King has um, recently hinted, I think it was last week, that he's no longer expecting any rapid um, decrease in the renewable energy target. So as far as large-scale renewables in Australia goes, that's definitely good news. You have to see what the final um, position is. But I think certainty above everything else is what's needed at the moment, even if it isn't the best outcome as far as retaining the original RET. Just having certainty means that these investments can go ahead. The electricity market review in WA, one of the things uh, that, that could potentially have a big impact on renewables is the um, network pricing structure. I've heard discussions of potentially having much higher fixed costs on, um, on domestic or residential electricity supply. Even heard, and this was definitely not from anyone in the government or anything like that, but whispers about the idea of you could theoretically have electricity rates like you have water rates, where you pay for the presence of the grid regardless of whether you're connected or not. Now, this has a, a big impact on the, the issue of the death spiral as renewable energy prices drop and electricity from the network increases, that pushes people more to rooftop PV. It's more competitive. They, um, if they put in network pricing, high fixed costs, then people will start looking at the equation and go, as batteries drop down in cost, maybe I'll get batteries and just go off-grid so I don't need to pay the fixed costs either. If you're paying electricity rates, then being off-grid with your own battery and PV system doesn't help you because if you're in the vicinity of the grid, you'd still be paying. I think that'd be very politically sensitive to try and introduce something like that though. The Emissions Reduction Fund, part of the federal government's direct action plan, there's some isolated support for renewables, but um, it's, it's restricted to uh, remote towns and as kind of proof of concept stuff. The net effect compared to the carbon pricing system is negative. Other states do have their own renewable energy targets though. ACT's got a very ambitious one, 90% by 2020. Uh, and South Australia, 50% by 2025. South Australia is well on track to hitting that as well, by the way. Just jump to the next one, please. 
This is the interesting headlines. China not only became the biggest investor in uh, renewable energy capacity last year, but also reached that milestone as well, that they spent more on renewable capacity than they did on conventional capacity. So um, that's, that's a big change from all of the headlines that you see about China just endlessly building coal-fired power stations. I'm sure they're doing that as well. I'm not going to make the beer bet there. Um, Wind last year set a record $19 billion of offshore wind farm investment and Australia is lagging. If I want to give you a, um, a headline for Grid Connected, I need to go back to 2013 with MacArthur Wind Farm, which was the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. In Chile last year, they've, um, they've done a couple of very interesting uh, projects or in the process of, of constructing a 110 megawatt concentrating solar array uh, for a mine site, so that's off-grid, 115 megawatts of wind for mining as well. The mining industry over there is, um, is power hungry and they're a, a, a much bigger exporter of energy, uh, much bigger importer of energy, whereas Australia's exporting, so they, they're far more cost constrained there. So they're turning to renewables. Domestically, Rio Tinto uh, have announced that they're building 1.7 megawatt PV array in their, their Weeper mine in Queensland. That sounded big, it was getting headlines at the time. There is a phase two of five megawatts that could potentially happen. But recently in WA, Sandfire Resources have announced a 10.6 megawatt PV array at De Grassa up in the northwest. And that includes six, megawatt, uh, six megawatts, there's 1.5 megawatt hours, so six megawatts for 15 minutes of battery storage, which allows them to transition from renewables back to diesel. But the whole idea of the project is just to minimize diesel consumption from the, the, the uh, generators they've already got installed. Solar City uh, is num number one PV installer in the US. They've announced that every unit will come with batteries integrated in the next five to ten years and supply energy at a lower cost than natural gas, and that's natural gas in North America. So that's a very cheap um, standalone power supply that they're proposing there. You're wondering where are they going to get those cheap batteries from? The I think it's the chairman of the board is uh, is Elon Musk, who owns Tesla, and he's built that gigafactory. And the owner of this, uh, the, the founder of this company is his cousin. So Tesla gigafactory batteries going into solar city PV battery combos results in low costs. And a Dutch wind turbine was crowdfunded um, 1.3 million euros in 13 hours. So that's the, the interest in the community and in investing in generation capacity is there. That, that exceeded everyone's expectations. Just one last slide, which is just some, um, some things to leave you on. The merit order effect, when you install PV or wind, once it's installed, it's all capex, very low opex. If the wind's blowing or the sun's shining, you're going to be generating and putting it into the grid. That makes you very competitive against anyone that's using fuel, and it means that gas and coal is pushed out of the market at times of low cost where in the past they would have just been making fairly, fairly reliable profits. And another one is that cumulative micro changes uh, are beginning to get together and have a macro impact. A quote here puts it a lot easier, uh, a lot more eloquently than I could, which is suddenly regulated monopolies are finding themselves in competition with their own customers. This is um, Synergy and Western Power in the past they were it. They they would they would sell to the residential consumers in WA, and no one else could could touch it. But now they can put the consumers can put PV on their roof, and potentially even batteries in their garage, and start competing with energy supply and um, distribution. That was something that I brought up in the um, the electricity market review industry consultation last year, because uh, it's something that I see as being a, a critical risk for. Western Power in WA and the, the energy industry, and apparently it was outside of the scope of the electricity market review. Uh, I think a lot of people see that as a significant risk, so the fact that it was outside of the scope was a bit, a bit worrying. But I'll leave you on those thoughts. Thank you very much.